Uh, right, so how does it happen? Everybody, everybody here, did you sort the fill sheets out, fill sheets out, pop fill sheets out? Uh, the kind of what I thought. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, uh, I'm going to be talking about what we call solar spectrum fermentation. Uh, my name's James, for those of you who have met me, I'm going to be calling the DIY for the room Philip, who's not here, he might pop along a bit later. I'm going to have one of the pages, but obviously it's a, it's a group effort. We're super happy with this. We're the first partner of DIY for the to actually be able to do what they call power pot. Uh, now, Emily here from Clinton's, Clinton's have a pot on Terra. But it's, it's a small program that they operate where if you bought coffee from them for a while, they allow you to experiment at their expense on the farm to bring in new ideas with their method of innovation, which is really, really interesting. Now, what we wanted to look at uh, was looking at light and the, the, uh, the light spectrum. Now, we've done an article on this on our website before, so some of you would have read it. If any of you were in Milan and went to the year one company, there was the year one company there. But in short, light is essentially a photosynthetic organisms, so we need light for life. There's some evidence in brewing, uh, when you look at like common bottles or like beer bottles, um, you get different effects on organisms that are controlled by different spectrums of light that we're looking at. And what we wanted to do is look at whether this affected fermentation specifically in coffee. So our objective here is yeah, basically just to check the influence of different colours in fermentation tanks. We use one varietal, Arara, that's the same varietal that you've just chosen out there. We've always liked this variety, it's got some good acidity to it, there's some good fruit to it, so it's not too uh, chocolate nutty to not sort of be able to show off a full spectrum of variation in there. Fermentation is anaerobic. Um, I say anaerobic with the uh, caption around it because essentially we were working with little plastic tubs that we put together. We tried our best to kind of seal them the whole thing with tape, but it's certainly not airproof in that sense. So whilst they were closed, and they were anaerobic style, they were fully anaerobic. The reason we did anaerobic rather than aerobic is because anaerobic fermentation generates less heat, and we wanted to reduce the effect of heat on the fermentation as a, uh, as a factor in what we were going to go and taste. The first year we did a 60 hour fermentation. So in the seal tank, 60 hours, out onto the little drying area that they have. For those of you that have been to Terra, or those that have seen the pictures of those little circles, they have a bed with lots of little circles, so our coffee would have been spread out on those circles to dry. And we did the red, green, blue, yellow, transparent, and black. So covering the full area there, transparent and black being the two ways that are really common in fermentation these days, if you're not looking at colour, you would do it out, or you do it in a closed environment. So these are the these are the tubs that we had. So you can see they're just it's just plastic tubs sealed up. We didn't want to go anything too high tech here. We wanted to make sure that it was easily replicatable and easily replicatable by other farms should it be interesting. Uh, and again, you can see they're just fitted with basic airlocks. And just on the right hand side there, you can see the trays that we had. So for the first year, these are the results that we got. What was quite interesting is that when you look at the top, and this is the spectrum in order, we actually found a correlation between the light wavelength and the score that they were. So essentially, coffee that was uh, fermented under red light tasted the best. Uh, and that's just the variation of what's going on there. This stuff at the bottom here, CB average and F value, this is part of the rigor of the test that we do. So Deterra have uh, um, a number of resources available to them. One of them is uh, a lady called Julie, uh, who actually looks at all the sort of statistical variation and the modeling and everything else to make sure that the results that we get are actual results, not assumptions or, or that side of stuff. So it's pulled together from there. The variation that we had was minimal. There was a couple where there was a bit more of a, a stretch that made it statistically a little bit weaker, but the majority of these were statistically strong, um, and it really correlated really nicely. So far, so good. Hey, we've got a project. This appears to have worked. This is super easy. All good. We had uh, another piece that we looked at with the attributes rather than just score. 
So this first piece is just looking at purely on the score of the sheets. This one looking a little bit more at the attributes. And you can see on the right hand side to you the number of attributes we put down there. So one of the things we weren't sure about is does color maybe increase in uh, like is it intensity or is it complexity? These are all parts of what we were looking at here. We found to a degree there was some difference there. The total attributes on the right is the number of attributes that were written down by all the couples there. So if the couples kept the same attributes, that's fine. But these are all the different ones they've got there. And then the common sensory notes in the middle of what we found. So year one, all good. We cupped in Milan, we showed it off, we were like, hey, this is great. It's, uh, you know, you want to put an extra point or so on your coffee, ferment it on your red light, it'll be brilliant. So what were we going to do with year two? Obviously, we have to go somewhere else. Part of what I really wanted to do was, uh, through back to a guy, I don't know if any of you have heard of a guy called Neil Harbison, that he builds himself as the world's first human cyborg. Uh, and that's because he was born colorblind, and he has a sensor fitted to the back of his skull that uh, is a little computer sensor and it reads light and it plays light in the form of noise into a skull and you can translate color into a sound and then sort of understand the world that way. And he talked about a breakthrough moment when he realized everything that he was getting the programmers to program in was based on visible light, yet the sensor wasn't contained constrained by visible light. So what I wanted to do here was a similar thing, of like, okay, well, if we know red's the best, and then infrared and sound is after red, what's stopping us moving into that spectrum? So year two very quickly came, let's look at the infrared spectrum, do we get more of and better? As well as, when you consider light and wavelength is just energy, was the 60-hour fermentation period the premium option, like is red good for 60 hours, but blue good for 70 hours, and yellow good for 90 hours, or something like that. So yeah, we moved to the far end. Uh, the objective that we did here is again looking at the fermentation time. So if you look at the duration side, it's the 48, 72, and 90 hours under the same color spectrum that we did in year one. And then this is just the, the coming around. So you can see the same boxes used again, so we didn't change anything, we kept everything the same. It's the anaerobic process again, breaking them apart on there. The difference that we had this year is we couldn't do so many repetitions, whereas year one we did three repetitions to check for consistency. Because we broadened the fermentation times this year, we meant to do less repetitions. Uh, and then, yeah, objective two to move into the non visible spectrum uh, on the infrared side of it. Here's the different infrared uh, options. Well, not all were infrared. Um, if I just skip back a slide, you see we've got halogen, infrared heating lamp, LED grow lights. Now, they normally have a mixture of different lights in there, so they'll be majoritively one color, but with a few other bits in there. So we have a 144 spectrum and a 60, which is just the number of lights that made up each head. Uh, and then we also had submerged LED uh, lights because also one of the things we're looking at once you move into the containers, you see the thing well, we're only exposing the top level of the lights and what's going on underneath. So, do we need to find a way to reach more uh, coffee? I think one of the conversations we're having just before is like, yeah, how do you upscale this? How do you make it bigger? And this is one of the things that we saw, we saw trying to figure out how we would do that. So, this year, we got completely different to what we had last year, which was incredibly, I, I almost want to say anticlimactic, before it became incredibly exciting. So in the first year, it's, it sat with the spectrum, with red at the top, quite clearly. The second year, we found blue and yellow, which we previously didn't like, to be at the top. Now, that's, Interesting, I had a meeting with the terror yesterday, so he's had like one evening to digest the results of what we're, what we're feeling there. Um, there was a little bit more variation around this time than we had before. So it's interesting to see how that has stretched and how that hasn't stretched. But what is consistent, and which is interesting, is that the black and the transparent at the bottom here 
are both the worst. So that's two years we've done this, and essentially what we're doing now is the least impactful on the flavour of coffee, which really suggests that actually there's something worth digging into on this one. If we look at the, uh, just breaking it down from 90 hour fermentation time, so the 90 hour fermentation, some of those coffees were on the table today, so I'll finish on the slide and we'll go around and see, see what people got. But the 90 hour fermentation time, the blue was at the top, the yellow was at the second. What's interesting here is that the green has dropped overall to be below the black and transparent. So again, hinting, and I say hinting because we need to do some more repetitions, uh, but it's hinting that, okay, maybe green at this time is actually worse at certain areas, so it's suggesting time will vary as well as color filtration through it. If I move through to the non-visible range, or the, the red end of it, we can see quite interestingly that the control is actually the second best. So on all of these, we've had one just to make sure that hey, we're doing nothing, or we're doing all we normally do, where does that go to control it? Um, and it's the halogen lamp that has come out the best. And the halogen lamp, interestingly, remains in the visible spectrum, not the infrared. So there's something around the infrared. The infrared is a little bit higher. So we have infrared beating lamp down here. That's universally disliked, but as the second word is, it's a beating lamp, and we know there's an impact of heat on fermentation. So there could be a time dynamic going on there with that, or it could just be a pure house and out heat thing. Generally, you don't want coffee to get too warm when you're fermenting it, else you get a lot of issues. The next two ones that were not so good are the LED grow lamps. Again, they mix different types of lighting together. So you've got one with ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is normally a big no-no. So that's right at the opposite end of red on the spectrum. Uh, so that's not very good. And then the 1836 blue. These ones were done for 60 hours, so it's much more in correlation with as we found in year one. But the addition of blue light has pulled down the effect or what we expected from red light. So there's some variation going on there. The submerged red, interesting, but it's, it's up there. There's, there's still something going on there. But then the infrared is the top of the lot below the control, but it's still below the control. So we can't get carried away about infrared. It suggests that maybe that's pushed it a little bit too far, but that's kind of why you do these things to test where the hand goes up. But yeah, so red halogen lamp is in the visible spectrum, but again, it seems to be then consistent with year one that some form of controlled red lighting is producing an effect more than we expected uh, than just neutral. So, a brief little charge from there because we still gotta digest some of this stuff and go through the results fully, but the main conclusion here is that we are not finished yet. Um, these projects that you sign up to tend to be a much longer term project than you would think. You know, it's, it's often easy to be like, oh, we go in, we do it for a year, we get out, we got a result. That's just not how things work. Um, but it definitely suggests to me, I don't know if you agree, I'm hoping that you do, that colour has an effect on fermentation. So we need to build more iterations. Uh, next year, they're already running only this, this year we did 28 different samples that we had to cut and differentiate to give us the, the details that we've got. Next year is going to be more, uh, but they're really, really excited by where this is going and what's going, what's going on. Um, some of this does feed into work they've already done. From how many here have been to the terror? Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, okay. So if you go to the terra, like one of the early pieces they talk about, they've now implemented in their nursery, or for any of you that are into gardening, is that red light has a positive effect. So red shading over nurseries produces more vigorous plants, healthier leaves, bigger leaves, it improves that rate of being able to plant out. So there is previous science that backs up red light and that red spectrum being beneficial for plants. Um, blue light has played a role as well. There's been some studies on beer about red and blue light and pieces there. So there's definitely something there and no big surprise that the coffee is no different to there. It's just yeast that's working on it. But we really need to make more iterations probably over the next one or two years before we can really conclusively say what's going on. 
Part of what we want to try and produce, if we can, is some sort of matrix that allows you to understand the time that you have versus maybe the life you need to use. Uh, and then is there anything further that we can go to push that? But we'll see where it goes. But the other big conclusion really as well is, uh, as I said earlier, all test produce results that the transparent and the black are the lowest scored. And that is how we're producing coffee now. If you think of how much we're doing with the uh, anaerobics, with the car uh, carbonic accelerations, most of them now are scales on big scales are like in those closed metal containers. We're like, okay, that shows that there's probably about a point and a half, which in the world of speciality, if you can you know, take a coffee from an 87 to an 88 and a half, that's really valuable for the farmer. It's great for us as consumers to be able to taste interesting coffee. But it shows we've got some real improvement there. Um, so let's talk about the samples that we cut. <laughs> Did everybody have a favourite? Did anybody think they were... Well, this, did anybody think there was no difference between any of them? Okay, that's good. No more I think it's cool. Oh, did you? Okay. It was difficult, yeah. I don't know, because I don't know. Oh, now it's cool. But I did think it it wasn't a start to get to the right board. And then you look around and you look <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it seems. I mean, it's like with any of these things, you've got to contextualise them. We're not, we're not adding a huge amount of points on, and it's all Brazil coffees, and it's there, and it's different. But it's, yeah, I think the more you go through, the more we start picking up the differences. And yeah, I mean, if you've had flavouring just beforehand, that never helps. <laughs> but um, okay, did, I mean, did, did anyone have a favourite on there? Did anyone feel comfortable sharing what their favourite one was? Yeah, on Henry. Number four. Number four? Oh, I thought that was yeah. Yeah. Show of hands for number four. Okay, a few. How about uh, number 19? I like Okay, Anybody pick up any defects? Yeah. Yeah, you sure? I mean, okay, I did. <laughs> so I mean, I'm going to be out there, and this is why I'm super excited because. Both times I've these, there's been a couple of coffees on that table that I've hated. Okay, okay. Yeah, there we go. A few people said, oh, so you hated number four? On table one, I found it musty. Okay, which, which one did you hate? Yeah. Uh, 19 had like a phenolic and so. Excites me. 22 and 19, I question yes. last five. It was just yeah. something I couldn't describe. It wasn't very nice. Yeah. Yeah, I was very chlorine phenol. Yeah. Did, did you get the same? No, I had something from number 10. Yeah. It's hair? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Oh, well, yeah, just yeah. Are you going to number 10 as well? No, I got 19, 22, like question mark, quite like phenolic, quite moldy. I really found it quite unpleasant. <laughs> so, this is when I, when I talk about being disappointed in the results, but then excited, this is exactly what I had. The first time I cut them, on the farm into terror. Uh, Gabriel went away and they said, we're going to re roast and recut them because we saw your face and you didn't look happy. <laughs> and it's true, I mean, I wasn't because I was like, you know, I'm, I'm there with, with, with a couple of customers and some other guests, and I'm like, this is really exciting. And I'm like, I hate these coffees that they've got on, what have they done to them? But then when you think about it, you start to go, hang on, something is going on here, there's something interesting there. If I skip through, these are the coffees that we had. So Blue 90. And that's really interesting. Remember, the blue came out as the top scorers. So there's an interesting dynamic that we've picked up on, we've not understood, that seems to have made the results a bit more controversial. So some people are loving a coffee that the other people are hating. And it's, I don't know, is there a little whiskey drinkers in here? For me, I don't like whiskey. And I found that people. It's a small set at the moment, but I, I found whiskey like flavours in those coffees that perhaps is why I don't like it. Whereas people that love that coffee seem to enjoy whiskey as well. So maybe there's something on that phenolic compound side that was being produced. I don't know. But yeah, if you look at your results then. So, number one, the red halogen light lamp, that was the best out of the red set that we did. Um, so, it's 50 watts. Red color, infrared heating lamp. That was the worst because of the heat. So 50 watts, infrared, and again, heating. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the physio lamp we had on there as well. And then out of the higher set, red, yellow, the blue, and 22 as the transparent. So yeah, the 22 where it was like maybe a bit off, that's kind of where that process is already. So does that mean that 19 is not having an effect or is it producing? Again, that's where we need to do repetitions to understand. But the fact that they were all reasonably different and in different areas is uh, really our key takeaway for this one. Um, I'm happy to cover any quick questions, but I know we need to clear the room just so we can get set up. But yes, it's done. Are you going to try some other origins or has this been tried in other origins? Uh, we're only going to need two. I'm very open to trying different origins, but I think we need to understand a little bit more about exactly what's going on before we do it. Part, part of me would say yes, I'd love to go somewhere with like really bright acidity to understand it. I mean, I think, you know, Brazil's got some great coffees and great variation in coffees, but, you know, there, there may be something going on with those higher areas. One of my first thoughts was, can you relate color to flavor? So just red encourage, I don't know, pineapple flavors and blue encourage mango flavors, for example. Not found that yet, but maybe that's easy to see in the virus <laughs> coffees. But in short, not yet, but I'd like to. Any other quick questions? Yes. Was um, they all taken from like a very similar altitude as well? Like exactly the same altitude. So um, there, there's one area, BV148, the box called, which is right at the entrance of uh, the terrorist you come in, and it's that variety of all plants, so all trees are the same age. Uh, same sort of conditions, same treatment. They all get picked by hand at the same time, and they're not homogenized and split down. So as far as we can control it, we can. The varietal is a yellow varietal. Uh, next year, we are going to be trying the difference between yellow and red varietals, because there is some research that shows there's a uh, photosynthesis difference between red and yellow cherries and, and ripening. So we're just going to see whether that further exacerbates that on fermentation. Uh, but yeah, so, I think that's us. If there's not any other questions, or if there is any other questions, I'm happy to answer that outside. I think Tom, you just need the room to set up here. Perfect. So yeah, if you'll just stay outside for a little minute.